It's a three-person committee, and the chair wrote Um John Career highlights are extensive. I would, we would be all day if I tried to list all his many honors and awards and publications. But it's, one thing that jumps out at me is that characterized John's whole career is his service to the profession. I was quite impressed with the fact that I think from the early 90s on, shaking and some heads nodding, including two individuals sitting next to each other. <laughs> okay. We'll uh we'll try that. Um, we'll try that and if I wander too much uh, um, wander too much we'll we'll go ahead and uh try to change things. Um well, thanks very much Mary very much appreciate um your introduction. Um I have several thanks to read here. I want to thank the Harry Memorial uh, Lect Committee as well as the Washington Statistical Society Statistics section of social statistics for the opportunity to speak here today. Um, some previous Harriet Memorial lectures have focused on a specific body innovation in one particular technical biological area. Um, other Harriet lectures have talked more broadly about uh, innovation processes in large scale statistical information organizations like the BLS, like Census Bureau, other federal statistical agencies, as well as our corresponding peers in the private sector and in academia. I'm going to follow the second path today and talk about innovation uh, relatively broadly um, for statistical information purposes, focusing primarily on the area of integration of multiple data. I'm doing that because we're seeing a lot of really important challenges. Uh, the idea of working with multiple data sources is both wonderful in terms of, uh, I believe, technical opportunities it presents uh, to a very wide range of methodologies for computer scientists. Um, but at the same time, it makes us rethink on a lot of our underlying operating premises. I'd like to talk about both of those uh, in various ways today. And I think this is a good time for us in a, in a systematic way to think about that. Um, in particular, I'll be suggesting that the entire notion of innovation uh, as we attempt to develop and then provide uh, statistical information products and services, are uh, we thinking about innovation not in terms of the novelty as such, um, but instead focusing on the value that we're delivering to our stakeholders. In a particular, we suggest that we think about innovation as a set of positive sum decisions in which we're trying to increase that value uh, primarily by improving uh, certain measures of quality, risk, and cost. So we'll see things about that overall idea, about the crucial uh, role of empirical information uh, about quality, risk, and cost characteristics and the linkage of that with value as well as the linkage of each of those characteristics with specific design decisions that we make. We need to understand as much as we possibly can about all of those dimensions. Um, and then third, we'll spend a little bit of time talking about the human element behind that. We're going to be talking about hypothetical models and a number of other things like that, but it's very much worthwhile to understand and, and bear in mind uh, as we're working through all these ideas, ultimately matter to the extent that they end up having an impact. And that impact includes all of us. Uh, people involved with production of statistical information, as well as everybody who benefits uh, both directly and the secondary matter 
uh, from the information that we provide. All of that's terribly important. You need to bear in mind that human element as well. Uh, we're going to be taking a look at that bottom line, those three general ideas, and developing them. Uh, first of all, talking about thinking uh, in detailed way about stake of value in the context, again, of integration of multiple data sources. And we'll frame that integration primarily in the form of a thought experiment. This is going to be largely hypothetical, relatively high level of abstraction, partly to avoid getting too deep in too many weeds. But we're going to be think thinking about a thought experiment, which we try to improve quality, risk, and cost, and how we might be able to frame that to some degree as, again, a set of positive summary decisions. And then we'll spend a little bit of time at the end talking about some implementation features that are also very much worth bearing in mind and are going to require a great deal of attention as we try to work out these details in greater depth. When we think about integration of multiple data sources, it's worthwhile to think about where that work came from uh, to begin with. A uh, store focus for most of our statistical agencies has been focused on sample surveys with some use of administrative records. Uh, but in the last decade or so, we've been seeing a great deal of attention directed towards so-called big data, uh, sometimes called organic data or non-design data. I'll give two examples here, and then we'll work this through a number of times as we go through the rest of the presentation. Uh, first example, we'll call it example A, is a mnemonic for the exercise of appending microdata. We have a basic sample survey, but we have one or more items that we think are either too costly or too burdensome in terms of our respondent burden for us to try to collect through a direct set of questionnaires. We instead seek to append that information to our basic survey data collection uh, from some form of either administrative or commercial record. Now, one example of this is in the National Immunization Survey. Um, my wife and I were respondents to an early form of the National Immunization Survey when our children, who are now in their 20s, were very young. I happened to be the person who picked up the phone. They started asking questions, and I said, I have no idea. We don't have that card in front. I literally had one kid on my hip, and the other kid who was about two and a half years old running around in circles. Uh, that's not the time to ask a parent about the fine details of exactly uh, when uh, one of your children obtained a particular inoculation. Uh, apparently, my wife and I were not the only ones who experienced And at some, some point, the questions instead amounted to saying, do we have permission to, in fact, contact your health care provider for your child and obtain the inoculation information from them? Um, and if so, could you please provide us with the name of contact information for it? Considerably lower burden in terms of the con, uh, kind of load uh, imposed. So comments apply, for example, the Consumer Expenditure Survey. I see a number of my consumer expenditure colleagues in the audience here. When we're thinking about a number of very complex questions regarding features of what you bought and what the price structure was uh, for what you bought, again, it can in some cases be <clears throat> considerably less burdensome if we simply try to link that information. It's an example, it's a great deal of interest. The goal is we're trying to reduce cost burden and as possible in some cases improve quality. Instead of having this somewhat frustrated father on the other side of the line saying, I have no idea uh, when my uh, child, in fact, received their inoculation, uh, presumably providers uh, are of considerably higher quality. Example B that we're going to be using off and on, uh, we have this mnemonic for use of a backbone and bridge. What the backbone in question is a set of one or more groups of administrative records. If you're lucky, it's a single set. If, on the other hand, you're less than lucky, you don't get complete population coverage from one set of administrative records, you have to integrate one or more sets, essentially in a patchwork, um, using a body of methodology that would be somewhat analogous to what we're accustomed to thinking about for multiple frame surveys. Very frequently when we carry out that type of exercise, we say these are wonderful administrative records, but, and the but might be, for example, we have incomplete data or the variables as defined in the administrative record system are not exactly capturing the concept that we're trying to capture for our purposes. So we end up in some fashion or another needing to develop a sample survey to serve as a bridge between prospectively the very rich source of administrative and commercial records that we have and accounting for the limitations that we have, so a bridge that we end up having to have. That in itself is not a new idea. I see a number of colleagues here in the audience who have worked previously with the current employee statistics program, and you can think about that as in some ways the classic example of the backbone and bridge data collection exercise. The backbone in that question consists of 50-plus sets of administrative records from state and equivalent 
unemployment insurance records. And on the other hand, the bridge recognizes the fact that records we have from the unemployment insurance are made available to the Bureau of Labor Statistics on a time lag basis. What we really want to have are employment information as contemporaneous as we possibly can. So the bridge in that case is a sample survey try to collect roughly contemporaneous records, but in a way that is very carefully aligned with the under underlying administrative records set. We have many cases, some in practice and some in prospect, along the same lines. A lot of really interesting methodological questions. For those examples, as, many other, as well as many other examples, uh, you start working through the deep weeds on any one of those, and you say, golly, this is absolutely fascinating. At some point, you need to step back a little bit and say, is this really worth it? Is this really going to deliver high quality information for the stakeholders in a way that they really need? So is there some way we can take these really neat possibilities and try a systematic way to evaluate and then integrate those multiple sources, possibly in the way of these two examples, or maybe in considerably more complex examples that take much more time to outline. Uh, and the basic proposal I'm going to be making today is in some ways in two uh, forms or two steps. The first one is we need to be thinking about a wide range of dimensions of performance, we'll call it, a uh, wide range of different measures of quality, risk, and cost. We need to pay careful attention to the balance of all of those factors. And then second, we need to take our traditional notion of design that we're accustomed to thinking about in a sample survey framework, extend that in ways that are similar to what our colleagues engineering have done for many years. Take those two ideas together, and I believe that helps us get, get some traction in what we're trying to accomplish. Now, to begin with, if we say, well, we want to talk about all of these, we want to have some systematic way of understanding this, it's worth well to begin and anchor our efforts in well, what exactly we're trying to accomplish. And this can be as either government statistical agencies or in principle as our equivalents in the private sector or academia. Now, the overall goal that we have, the mission that effectively all government statistical agencies have, is to provide the public with high quality information on a sustainable and cost effective basis. In the United States, where we have a decentralized system, we tend to have a few sentences after that that specify a particular area. For example, in the area of demographics or in labor economics and price economics, in agriculture or in public health or in education or other areas like that. But all of us have this common ground of saying we want to produce high quality information on a sustainable and cost effective basis. There's an awful lot packed in that short sentence. And I'd suggest that it's worthwhile to take that sentence and try to turn it into a schematic model. And in particular, say for the moment, suppose we're trying to estimate a certain parameter vector theta. And for the most part today, we're going to be thinking about relatively simple vectors. For example, populations, means, totals. But in principle, you can think about other types of estimates as well. Uh, for example, if you're interested in relatively pathological phenomena like health conditions and so on like that, often you're interested in some kind of tail quanta uh, related to some kind of measurement. In way, if you're interested in carrying out so-called evidence-based policy analyses, in many cases you may be interested in understanding an awful lot about regression coefficients or other types of model parameters. All those in principle we could be considering here today, but most of what we have here is anchored in relative <laughs> production like population means, totals, ratios, and so on. So for that vector theta, we're going to have some kind of value that we're trying to deliver to our stakeholders and believe that it is in some fashion a function of a combination of quality and risk and cost, where many people here in this room have spent many long years thinking about an awful lot of details related to these measures of quality, risk, and cost. Furthermore, we recognize that all of those dimensions are themselves random, stochastic in a certain sense. Therefore, instead of simply saying, I have a single measure of quality, risk, and cost in this dimension, we need to think about each of those as random variables. And then we have to say, well, what are we doing? Are we trying to, in some sense, integrate or find a quantile of each of those measures, perhaps integrating over time or over product lines or over state? a little bit of each, each of those in turn. First of all, the methodological community has tended to focus most of our attention in the area of quality, and most agencies will have a fairly clear statement on their websites or otherwise saying, well, quality is itself a multidimensional uh, notion. Uh, some of the dimensions are fundamentally qualitative in nature. For example, the relevance um, or the tightness, comparability, coherence, accessibility that we have for our products as provided to our particular stakeholders. 
And on the other hand, uh, many people in the room have spent most of the time thinking about quantitative measures of quality. You and the frame work of a total survey error model or extensions of a total survey error model to its that go well beyond sample surveys as such. Uh, Paul Beamer and co-editors have a really nice edited volume from about a year ago uh, in that area that gives a really nice flavor of both an awful lot of accomplishments in the area, but an awful lot of really interesting further opportunities uh, that all of us in have to, to explore further. Uh, so about things like what's my population coverage that I have for one or more of my sources of information, what kind of linkage errors do I have, which is crucial, I'm not thinking about combining multiple sources, as well as other issues that we're accustomed to seeing in sample survey settings like definitional errors or incomplete data. That's the set of dimensions that have tended to receive most of the attention. But there are two other dimensions that we're going to be suggesting here. There was an enormous amount of attention from our colleagues, especially in program management, and in field management. And I just, in fact, that methodologists have an awful lot to contribute to these areas as well. Uh, the first of those we can characterize as risk. So this is in response to that mandate that we carry out a work on a sustainable basis. And when we're thinking about integration of multiple sources, two examples of risk that are especially problematic, especially sailing, are in the area of disclosure limitation. That in itself warrants an entirely separate talk. And another phenomenon that shows up very frequently we can put on this umbrella of risk is phenomenon related to so-called break-in series. For example, if I am obtaining my estimates or integrating my estimates based on multiple sources, cases, our agencies have little or no control over that source of information. If we lost it, maybe tomorrow morning, maybe we get a little bit of notice before we're going to lose that source. How do we end up dealing with that? That's a risk dimension. It's really important for us to manage uh, carefully. And when you hear program managers saying, well, I'd like to think about multiple data source integration. I'd like to think about this administrative source here. But I'm kind of hesitant. One of the reasons they hesitate a great deal is this breaking various phenomenon and related risks. And then finally, to think about costs. Um, it's worthwhile to consider costs as measured both by burden and by expenditures. Putting all of that together, uh, we can say that we have a performance profile vector, relatively long vector, with vectors that will characterize as quality, risk, and cost, respectively. And remember, each of those tied in with a particular estimate, a particular value of theta, popular again, mean total, something like that, that we're trying to estimate. Now, in certain ways, we have been thinking about this problem, we collectively, thinking about this problem at least since the 1920s, arguably before. Um, way back in the 1920s and 30s, uh, people said, okay, I can get at least a little bit of traction on the trying to carry out inference for populations. How am I do that? Well, suppose, in fact, I had a randomization device that would tell me something about sample certain units within my population. Probably we can develop some really interesting results in a relatively simple form that can help us understand something about those sample surveys that we have, and in particular sampling variability that we have, and some measure of quality related to the results and implications. Um, and we have then wonderful sets of results that were developed beginning in the 1920s and continuing to today. It's primarily on the dimension of variability of quality associated with sampling error. So for example, I more or less arbitrarily copied one case from Cochrane. You have a stratified sample and you wish to carry out a combined regression estimation exercise for that, uh, we have at the bottom of this page uh, the corresponding uh, um, formula expression uh, for the underlying variance that you have for the combined regression. So especially if you have a large enough sample size and you have bias, it's pretty much the minimum standpoint, and you're, consequently your variance itself is, is your uh, best measure that you have. Furthermore, if we have that type of expression, we can then start to get some ideas about how we, in fact, could optimize or at least reduce that variance term. Say, well, those straight up, can I move those boundaries around? This expression involves some sample NH values, sample allocations for those individual straight up. Can I change things? And again, we have a wonderful body of literature developed over the course of several decades in that area. We've also seen variations and extensions of that, for example, involving noise variance functions, and more recently, small areas, small domain estimation. All of that is very much anchored 
this idea of saying, can you tell me something about the ability of one quality measure that I got a certain set of estimates? In addition, the college in the behavioral science area over the last 30 or 40 years, gee, this is interesting, but in many cases, we can have estimate, estimation processes in which the overall uncertainty that we have is not entirely dominated by sampling error, but maybe have a substantial component, maybe even be dominated by certain non-sampling error components. Um, primarily, we're worried about bias in this case, but in some cases, there as well. Once again, can I somehow improve sampling error components, sample by improving my instrument design, or by changing my choice of mode uh, through which I'm going to collect my data? It's a traditional approach that we have for sample surveys. The suggestion we have today is that if we are going to be trying to take these general ideas we have before, they're very worthy and very much worth trying to preserve and extend as much as we possibly can. And so we want to, in fact, now instead of just talking about sampling error or just overall sampling plus non-sampling error, we're trying to talk about a very wide range of quality as well as cost and risk components. We use the same basic design idea we had before. And and so we're going to be borrowing a lot of ideas in engineering. In one way or the other, we'll typically think about design, saying it's a form of targeted resource allocation. That's the way to characterize it. For our purpose of discussion here, and talking about producing high-quality statistical information, it means we're going to be talking about targeted, structured resource allocation, in which we're going to be accounting for certain environmental factors. We'll get to some examples in a few minutes. We're doing that to this deliver a certain level of performance, again, is characterized by quality, risk, and cost measures. And we're we'll doing that for purposes of producing estimates of a certain parameter vector, called theta, and we're for the purpose and for the use of a particular set of stakeholders. It's the overall charge that we have. Taking what we had before, thinking primarily about sampling error, now trying to expand that in a considerably better way, but again, anchored in the fundamental principles that we had before. If we have that as our charge, we better start thinking about at least a little bit more in the way of details. Um, one point to bear in mind here, if we're talking about resources, is to recognize that statistical work arguably is a very capital-intensive business, where almost all of the capital in question is capital, mostly in its own form, in human capital. Uh, examples of where we have to invest in tangible capital. Uh, so up if we're thinking about acquisition of a certain number of data sources themselves. Um, and one wonderful experience that you can have if you are talking with anybody who is involved with that acquisition exercise is the extent to which they will often have to move heaven and earth for years in many cases, where they can come up with a solid negotiation, solid agreement with a prospective data source in a way that is truly satisfactory to both of the parties or all of the parties involved, okay? A lot of intensive human capital, intangible capital investment, simply in acquiring the data sources themselves, getting permission to use them. Uh, second, there's a wide body of methodology and technology, and most of the people here in the room, that's what our primary focus is on. Um, once we have a body of methodology and technology, we have to put it into practice in almost all cases nowadays. That amounts to saying I'm going to have a production system that back is well aligned, well tuned to application of the particular body of methodology and technology. We have a lot of management practices that can have a huge effect on whether, in fact, all of that other work is not effective in a given case. And then so we need to think about research and development efforts on an ongoing basis to improve each of the previous dimensions that we've been considering here. Okay, so this is a good time to step back and recap what we've done so far. We have a space. Again, this is the way engineers often think about this type of optimization exercise. A certain space in which I want to operate. In our case, it's defined, first of all, by our target parameters. What are we trying to estimate? Second, it's defined by a certain set of prospective data users who have a certain value that they have the information that we're providing to them. Again, largely as a function of quality, risk, and cost. And the trade-offs involved with all of those may very well vary, change quite a bit and work across different sets of data use for different sets of stakeholders. In addition, we need to think about environmental factors. We'll call those Z for our purpose of discussion here. Essentially, features that can be really important, have a really important effect 
and all of our quality risk and cost components but are under our control. We're lucky we get to observe some of them, but they're not under our control. And finally, we'll have a vector X that we call our design vector. This is going to represent all of the resource allocation decisions that we just defined in the last couple of slides, involving, for example, data source, methodology, systems, and administration. So we hope maybe we can control some components of X. The rest of it, we have to understand as much as we can about it, that's the environment which we're offering. That a little bit further. We've already had one schematic model in which we tried to think about linkage between the value we're delivering to our stakeholders and these multiple dimensions of quality risk and cost. Now we've asserted that we think we can do something with design to help us to improve some characteristics of quality risk and cost and start a basic sampling area that we had originally. Then we're going to have a second schematic model in which we think about these dimensions of quality risk and cost as functions again of our design vector as well as corresponding environmental factors, plus residual effects, things we need to get to observe with more control. And that certain set of parameters, what we might call our performance surface, and related to dispersion function that we may have attached to our term E. I'll emphasize again the word schematic. In most cases, realistically, we are never going to have enough information to be able to carry out rigorous estimation of all the parameters of that underlying model. Nonetheless, my fundamental proposal today is that it's very much worthwhile to think in the schematic fashion about this. And when we see certain types of decision processes and we say, gee, what's going on here? It may be worthwhile to try to interpret it within the context of these schematic models. I'll give some examples of that later on. So some basic quality questions that we have regarding this function. We can think about in terms of the graph that I have displayed here. Uh, along the two horizontal axes, in this three figure, we have X and Z. Remember, X is your control variables, Z is your environmental variables. Maybe you get to observe them, but not control them. It's one of our performance measures, and we might think about this, for example, as mean squared error of an estimator in this case. And we can ask a number of questions about what that surface looks like. One of the first questions we ask is, is it a nice surface? Okay, I might characterize a nice surface as saying, do I have a small number of additive factors? Maybe, for example, 1x and 1z will pretty much dominate the entire thing. I'd like to live in a world like that because I think I know something about optimization if I get to live in a very simple world. Or, on the other hand, do I live in a world that isn't nearly as nice? For example, do I have an awful lot of very strong interactions between x and my z terms? And so, in terms of the graph that we have here, instead of getting this nice flat looking bowl at the bottom, in some ways very forgiving, can move your X and Z a little bit, it's really not going to hurt you much in terms of your P. If you live essentially on a very sharp ridge, or very close, you want to think about it as a trench, the bottom very sharp trench, any kind of deviation, maybe in your X or your Z or both terms, may cause a frightful penalty into the increase, in this case it means greater error or some other kind of performance measure, that you were hoping you could try to minimize or at least reduce. Where do you live with that? What do you understand about those interactions? Uh, that you have in those particular cases. Now, it's not really hypothetical. Let me give you one example. It's been these papers a lot in the last few months. I want to have an alternative data source, a non-survey data source, that's going to require people to give consent to link. Get back to the pediatric case that I had before. If people, in fact, are pretty trusting, in fact, at a relatively high propensity of people to provide that informed consent. If, on the other hand, they read some of the newspaper headlines that they've been seeing about Facebook and other types of situations, they say, Ooh, I'm not so sure about that. I don't even know who this person is on the other end of the phone. They say from the government or representing the government, I'm not so sure. Does that end up affecting the propensity of some consent, affect the interaction between environmental factor Z and what you were hoping to be one of your design factors? Let's go ahead and try to substitute or use those administrative records. So we're done here essentially by a ridge. Furthermore, for those of us who are methodologists, we develop a really great methodology. It looks really great. It looks like the, you think the performance characteristics are like this nice well behaved goal here. The two, one of our management personnel who actually have to implement this stuff, and you see the hesitancy on the back of their minds, they're worth sick. That in fact, you're telling them about a fish and not telling them about a nice hole. What can we do to address that? What kind of information can we develop to understand maybe you do live 
at the bottom of the trench, and if so, we'd better be aware of it, or do you, in fact, live in a nice forgiving bowl where a little, a little bit of movement was not that part of the yeah. And we can think about, again, trench like that. We can also think about constraints. And for the purpose of discussion on this, I'll, I'll reduce this to a two-dimensional case. We're thinking about conditioning in one particular value of z. And we're saying now horizontal axis is x, vertical axis is p. And I say, I think I know something about what looks like a quadratic surface here. I think I know if I could estimate that pretty well. I, I think I remember something about trying to optimize that from my undergraduate calculus days. Somebody comes in and says, well, actually, John, that's kind of a notional graph that you have here. But you see, you don't get to live anywhere you want on that space. You don't get to move your x anywhere you want. All you use the green area on the left. Otherwise, sorry, folks, nothing available. You're just away from what you'd really like to do. Well, I take a deep breath, pull up my sleeves, dust myself off, and say, okay, I still know what to do. I know how to minimize something even if I have to, to deal with boundary conditions. And that says, oh, hey, John, you confessed a couple of minutes ago that you don't actually know what the surface looks like. You hope know something about that surface, but in fact, it's not nearly as pristine as what you have here. What a prediction bank. Go back to the dispersion effects related to the e term I was displaying a few minutes ago. What kind of bands do you have around those? It's not discouraging. Anybody. It's to say, well, if in fact we are trying to carry out something like optimization, at least improvement, let's start with a little bit of traction on the fact that we should try to get better information. And they should try to carry out some kind of systematic data collection to understand something about that neighborhood, at least, in which we're trying to operate. Same things about so the basic suggestion when we're integrating multiple data sources is that we should focus design decisions on improvement of the value delivering primarily by focusing on what we think we know something about, which is these performance profiles, quality, risk, and cost, maybe with patient of design decisions we think we can control, as well as understanding as much as we can about the environmental factors that may have an effect on the extent to which those design decisions really are going to have a desired impact. Turns out, if you want to talk about that sort of thing, and you talk to people in certain areas of sociology or business, they'll say, ah, you're talking about innovation. And there's, in fact, wonderful literature on innovation. I've cited a few examples here. Uh, but I would especially highlight one I have at the bottom of the page. This is a wonderful paper by Don Gilman, now from 22 years ago. But if you read it and you don't look carefully at the date attached to it, you'll think you're talking pretty much about contemporaneous experience in any number of agencies. Don's a wonderful discussion there. I've also commend to you all the discussions. Uh, articles are published immediately after Don's. It's a wonderful read to go back to. If you do all of that information, both some considerations in Don's paper and the literature that I reference, it's worthwhile especially to think about three cases because especially useful of interest to our particular work with integration of multiple sources. The first is generally characterized as continuous improvement. Um, of, in this case, the quality risk cost profile that we have for our current products and services. We say, I'm fixing data, I'm fixing my user group, all staying the same. What I'm going to do is conditional upon that, try to see if I can move my X's a little bit and get some improvement that I have. The example A that I have, where we're going to take a basic sample survey and try to append a few additional variables to that, which fit roughly in that category of continuous improvement. I had a problem with some combination of cost, burden, and quality. If for this particular item I'm able to find administrative or commercial record replacement, I think I can do a little bit better. That's the desire that we have in that case. In that case, you can stop back and say, well, what, well okay, fine, but what's your X in that case? Essentially the full specification I have for my sample design, as well as a specification of all the work that has to go into a system for capturing the administrative record. How are you going to approach these pediatricians and others provided the inoculations to the kids? How are you going to capture that information in a systematic way? What's the protocol by which you do that? Also, how do you carry out record knowledge in that case? So that's an example of the X terms you have, large under your control. The Z are factors that we don't have in control, but are going to have enormous impact respectively on. Again, for example, consensual propensities that we were talking about before, as well as the quality of the microdata. In some cases, pediatric offices, for example, have really good records. At times, you walk to the pediatric office each day, and they are shuffling 
think through papers and things like that, they may not necessarily be able to provide the information that you want. We may have missing data problems, a lot of other issues like that. In any case, we can also think about P, essentially representing the set of fixed and variable costs related to integration of our work, as well as related data access as well. It's very much worth bearing in mind, especially when we're thinking about using administrative or commercial records, because you will often hear the assertion, this is exciting, they're free, or they're almost free. And that's in fact true if what you're talking about is the incremental cost of one additional record conditional upon having had the painful negotiation I described before, having designed an entire system that you end up having to have for them. And furthermore, you designed a system for, in some ways, tuning to an administrative record that you have. If, in fact, you have an administrative record that's nice and constant over time, it's locked in, that's great. But if, in fact, you have an administrative record or commercial record system that is itself evolving over time, can we confident that if you have a system in your face with that, it's going to work tomorrow or a year from now? Not, we need to think again about the intangible capital investment that we made to develop, test, and implement that system. We effectively assign a very fast appreciation rate in some cases to that investment. We think we're dealing with a commercial or administrative source that's highly volatile in nature. Um, that's going to have a major bearing on your assessment of the cost that you have attached to them. Seems to a rich class of methodological questions. None of these are stop. There's none of them say stop, don't do this, but they always say, hey, let's think about this and let's see about methodological tools that we can apply to understand more about this. Okay, we understand about the performance profiles, and in particular, if we say we're trying to think mainly about modest changes in our X, that means for the curves that we were talking about before, I don't have to understand the entire curve from the side. Can I at least a little bit about that neighborhood? If so, how do I go about carrying out some type of exploratory exercise to understand what that neighborhood looks like? Well, and again, it's not in any way new. Uh, our colleagues in experimental design have been thinking about that for well over 50 years now, generally under the rubric of evolutionary operation. Can we borrow some of those ideas and adapt to our type of setting that we have here? And then again, we need to think about if we, in fact, do some kind of fine-tuning like that, modifying our XO design a little bit. Is this robust against variation in our values of C? Robust against variation in our environment. It's a category of innovation. This one is relatively modest, continuous improvement. And that's often what we will see people advocate when they talk about innovation. That's all really important. A second category is often characterized as disruptive improvement. We're still thinking about our current products, our current values of theta, and current users. But we think we can do something to create a dramatic change in the overall profile of quality, risk, and cost. What frequently see cited is could we do something that would dramatically reduce my costs? A wonderful historical example of this, uh, in the 1960s and 70s, as telephone population coverage became pretty much 100% in the United States, and as the cost of a telephone call reduced dramatically, you will see her evolving from mostly focusing on a knock on the door, so called two-letter type sample surveys or mail surveys, and well, wait a minute, instead of the knock on the door ones, we're need some kind of interaction between the respondent and the data collector. Can we do bones instead? Okay, that's a basic question. There's wonderful literature on that. And one of the big selling points was dramatic reduction in cost. Instead of having to drive out there and spend several hours doing that type of contact work, you can just pick up the phone. On the other hand, you will also see in that literature from that era theories about that. Wait a minute. Are you trading off quality and cost? And in fact, are you getting the same quality of information through that telephone call as you would get in person? Some of you will remember the joke from that era, which would all get taller and thinner on the phone. Okay? And in fact, if you look at uh, any number of health surveys from that era, there was a very interesting pattern, continues to today, of when you, in fact, with the distribution reported height and weight in a telephone interview, a personal interview, if I carefully get uh, interviewed on the phone, I can say, I'm 130 pounds. I will not get away with that if somebody tries to interview me in person. Okay. Um, and looking about the case of multiple data source integration, um, the and bridge example that we had, for example, B is a good example of this. We are sending, instead of a sample survey, relatively 
and to rebase our work to a very degree on one or more administrative or commercial sources. We believe that, in fact, that may be highly informative in terms of the way in which we can tune our design. And we're hoping to be able to save either a lot in terms of cost or a lot in terms of quality as a result of that. And so that's our like case. On that case, uh, we say, well, the X, the design that we do have, for example, our choice of our background sources, as well as the detail of the bridge design, it's especially of interest for cases in which we're trying to deal with relatively rare subpopulations. Anybody who's, let's have to put you out there. How many people have been involved with surveys for rare subpopulations? Let me point your peers. What's the number one thing you worry about? Oh, my goodness, we spent so much on. Okay. But on the end, if it's a population that's rare and hard to get to, oh my goodness, I had to spend so much on screening. And in fact, that can often be the dominant cost component that we have. Okay, so, do I have a clever bridge design that can make really productive use of these administrative sources so that I no longer get in a situation where I have to chew up most of my budget just doing the screening questions to identify the subpopulation of interest? At that point, though, we then have to think about the details of the bridge design. Can we set something up in a really clever way? And furthermore, can I talk about the stability of the resulting background sources? Again, they're going to be there tomorrow. What do I have to think about in terms of depreciation related to the investments I'm making in that? And my performance vector as a result of that makes means I need to think in a lot of depth about the cost of those, both the background source and the bridge sample. And again, hopefully, efficiency gains I may be able to gain from those bridge options and the risk of losing a bridge source. For this disruptive improvement case, very much worthwhile to step back and say we've also got some rich classes, methodological questions there. In particular, if I have a major change in my design variable, okay, I'm no longer trying to move just to the neighborhood of where I had before. I'm trying to move way over on another side of that graph that we have displayed here. Do I know anything about what that neighborhood looks like if I have that kind of dramatic move? And if not, how do I go about, and if not, how do I go about trying to carry that up. Um, saying as much as we can, in particular, do we have ways of structuring relatively small, relatively low cost, low burden, quick turnaround pilot studies to tell me as much as I can about that other type of neighborhood, maybe far away from my design set points where I have my collection exercise now. There's a category, innovation. It's usually characterized as disruptive addition of new products and new data users. Um, it's happened, for example, you have a fundamentally different type of estimate you may have never considered before. Or you have the same set of estimates now, but before you may have been producing some relatively simple tables. People who are knowledgeable about this, so called power users, experts in this area, be able to access those data. And that's pretty much the end of the story. If you then say, oh, actually, I want to open up into these data for a very wide range of participants. I live in a different world and I need to think separately about my trade-offs, for example, between quality, risk, and cost. For example, it may mean I need, need to make a very large investment and make my website that I have extremely navigable. That may be the place where we add the greatest value in terms of what we deliver to our users. Some basic questions show up. If we say, well, before I was producing national level estimates, right? something simple like an unemployment rate or something more complicated. And we have a number of people in the audience who've spent a lot of time thinking about how we take general concepts that were developed originally for producing national level estimates, for example, the unemployment rate or poverty rate among children, and now so actually I need to produce those estimates at a much finer level of either geography or possibly other types of cross-sectional classification. How do I do that? At that point, you can argue that that's fundamentally a different type of product that's going to use a very different methodology that we may have had traditionally. So changing respectfully our values that we have for theta, our parameter estimates, our parameters that we're trying to estimate, as well as the underlying value function that we have, as well as changes in the underlying profile of quality, risk, and cost. All of that, you'd upset the whole Africa, you turn it all over, and we start thinking about that new products. They're fundamentally different. That's why they're called disruptive. In that case, we have to say once again, what kind of pilot testing and prototyping can I do to help me understand as much as I possibly can about both the value function and the profiles of cost and risk? Another crucial question at that point is not just can I do it once, but in fact I have a truly feasible pattern of stable production. How do I get to say more about that? That gets back.
back to the basic notion of positive sum innovation. We have set, we set a certain goal, we have a certain space in which we're trying to operate. We want to produce high quality information. We said we want to do that in a way that helps us to improve our vector profile of quality, risk, and cost. And we think it has something to do with both environmental factors, Z, and also some factors X that we can control. If you say go optimize this, you effectively have an uh, uh, ill posed problem because of all of those features, multiple dimensions, limited empirical information we have, as well as the fact that the design decisions that are being made are generally being made by large and complex organizations that are reflecting the interest and desires of many stakeholders. You take a large and complex organization with that type of information base and then drop that into a changing environment. There's a risk that you can end up having that organization, for totally understandable reason, engage in a series of decisions that amount to negative sum or zero sum type of decisions. And that means that organization is not going to be able to respond in as productive and quick a way as we would hope. It should be really great opportunities for us to do some really interesting work. So the proposal then is, well, how do we take that negative sum or zero sum type of exercise that arise from entirely understandable factors and try to turn it instead to a set of possible decisions. I don't have a perfect solution for that, but I have a few elements to suggest. Uh, one is to simply state the elements of what are we really trying to accomplish. Uh, second, uh, in terms of quality, risk, and cost. Uh, that in itself can be really eye opening. Uh, what kind of feasible condition and empirical information do we end up having on the dominant factors, the ones we control the X's as well as the environmental factors? Do we know? Which ones are dominant? What kind of conditioning are you? Which is typically what we have to do for this kind of optimization. Can we end up doing it? And finally, how are we going to go about aligning our management structures and our incentives as well as we can with those first two factors? If we have incentives lined appropriately and we have management structures lined appropriately, we can do an awful lot in a remarkably short period of time. And if we don't have a line, you can have some real challenges. And there's some options in terms of the conditioning uh, that we have. But we also need to think about implementation. And in particular, if you say, well, I did some pilot work, here's the information that I have. It's worth asking four questions. After all, uh, are we sure we have a clear idea about what we're trying to do in terms of conditioning and satisfies? Second, we have perfect information, again, about the surface, as I described, or the characterization in terms of the data and the disease and the constraints that we have. But can I understand something about the impact of uncertainty and at least get enough information to reduce uncertainty to some kind of or to have some kind of relatively decent set of decisions based on that? And then finally, what do I really honest to goodness know about design decisions? In particular, do I really have control over my X's that I have, or do I only have partial control? How quickly can I tune that if I'm due, for example, certain types of adaptive design? It's very worthwhile to think about that fact. Finally, the fourth really important factor is to be sure all the stakeholders involved have realistic expectations about the full trajectories that we're going to be experiencing in terms of research and development and information. Um, that can involve, for example, understanding as much as we possibly can about various decisions that can be made about are we going to have something that essentially is highly customized, one of my colleagues to refer to as lovingly handcrafted methodology. That's often what you have to have if you have something that's very new. And the other hand, have something that's very standard. Something more or less off the shelf we can apply it here, but nonetheless can, apply, you know, can provide an awful lot of value added. It's kind of a mixture of those, but it's very much a case by case decision about what exactly we have to do in terms of the degree of compensation. And if we need to start monitoring, accelerating, and refining. Particularly when you say, I have a great idea, that great idea as implemented the first time is likely to be at best a failure, worst a failure that discourages people. We hope this to have a failure that inspires people to do a little bit better next time. But it's extremely rare, the fact, we have a highly successful first pilot. So you need focusing and having realistic expectations about that. Um, that in turn ties in with the ideas of stakeholder value and what we're delivering. Uh, and in particular, we need to be realistic about what expectations are there, too. If we have a relatively modest goal, we're trying to have some kind of continued improvement, then we'll be sure we've spelled out and have a very clear consensus among our stakeholders about which dimensions of this overall performance profile are we trying to improve? Exactly how far are we trying to move that? So for a case of the pen variables, we say, look, our goal is we're just trying to get fewer frustrated parents and thus a higher level of collaboration. Otherwise, we pretty much want things to be steady state. That's a realistic expectation that you might have in that particular case. But for cases two and three, we're proposing disruptive innovation. All certainly requires 
those much larger investments up. What kind of expectations do we have, again, in terms of the trajectory as well as final outcomes in terms of cost or quality and risk, and also then the impact that we're going to end up having on our data users. Uh, several related management issues that we need to think about here, and I'll highlight just two of them for a moment. <clears throat> One of them, once again, is what kind of incentives do we have for all the major stakeholders in terms of surface and all the dealing in depth with the issues I described in the last few minutes. And also, something that's crucial is the extent can we, in some sense, mark, measure, and then harvest, and then reinvest any type of saving or benefit that we may have produced. We'll get to that in a second. And in particular, the question of how do we go about harvesting and getting some kind of benefit that you can invest is made extraordinarily complicated for federal statistical agencies and other large-scale statistical organizations that are producing their information as, quote, public goods. It's a very little literature in this area, and I won't be the details of it here. A uh, standard definition of public goods uh, says that we have something that we're providing that is going to be, quote, non-exclusive. In other words, it's difficult or impossible to prevent everybody from using it. That's really true for most of our methodology. We love to publish. In fact, we have a very strong expectation <clears throat> in terms of the transparency of what you do. You don't have valid methodology if you haven't put your cards on the table in most cases. The second dimension that we call, that, that we put some broad of public goods, is that something we're producing is called a public good. It is also, quote, not rivals. In other words, the fact that one person, one organization is using it, does some way diminish the value that we have. But that Linda, for example, might be using small area estimation methods that, in fact, the BLS or the Census Bureau is also using. Uh, at a minimum, it doesn't hurt us for to be using it. And in fact, it may be a very strong positive network effect because lessons you may have learned may in fact be very helpful for the Census Bureau, BLS, or other colleagues uh, to know too. So that's what we typically live in when we're trying to produce this information, characterize as public goods. There's some fundamental issues that arise with public goods. One is the notion of quality. We stood to depend fundamentally on how a particular set of users are going to use your data. For example, Linda's nodding your head right now. The results that you publish regarding, for example, crop estimates from uh, the June assessment, in fact, when you have one use in commodity trading pits, they may have a very different use for a lot of other stakeholders involved. All of them are important, but the quality may be very different for each of those. In addition, and the second fundamental issue that arises with public goods is that the limitations on so-called market signals, people are not putting cash on the barrel head, going to Linda and saying, Linda, here's X dollars for that table. She puts it all on the website. And as a result of that, there are limitations on the market signals to, uh, that end up resulting in we often, really your perspective, over more frequently underinvest in particular areas, especially technical areas, that are difficult to explain to other stakeholders or other types of inefficiency throughout. In addition, there's another issue that arises in a lot of different areas of economics, but especially in the area of public goods. And that's a distinction between so-called use value and option value. Use value arises when we have a specific, well-defined example. I have a number of colleagues here in the audience um, who work with the Consumer Price Index. In the Consumer Price Index, if you say, why do you publish the Consumer Price Index at the BLS? None answer, social security. Social security payments are, in fact, indexed to Consumer Price Index once a year. And furthermore, we have literally billions and billions of dollars of contracts in the United States that are also indexed to the Consumer Price Index. Something very concrete, very focused. We know what we're getting. We have a very good focus on what we're trying to accomplish. There's a second notion of value, though, that's actually important to think about statistics and related methodology, which is characterized as option value. This is the value that we derive from something at present from prospective future use. And for example, we will often publish estimates. And you may say, well, is this really something that you can articulate the exact use of it right now? And the answer might be yes. But in some cases, the answer is, well, sometimes it's terribly important. And Nobody notices you didn't publish it until they notice it. One example is there was a great deal of discussion in the public domain uh, after the financial crisis uh, of 2008. Uh, wait a minute. The government doesn't have highly timely, maybe daily, 
limits of fill in the blank related to, for example, the organizations are in arrears on their debts. How many of them are in default on their covenants? What do you mean we don't have that on a daily basis? Okay, nobody thought to ask that almost all the time, but suddenly in September 2008, it was a very salient topic and a topic of rigorous discussion with the in the economic and finance world after the fact. Um, it's true, I believe, for an audit of forms of characteristics of underlying methodology. For uh, working about integrating multiple sources, I want to have an animation procedure that is robust in some sense. Might be robust against usual things where a customer worrying about outliers, but might be robust against other characteristics. For example, integrating multiple sources, I'm almost always using implicitly or explicitly some kind of model. What if my model fails for a certain case? Or if I other types of characteristics that end up being a problem, for example, systemic problems that may arise on an episodic basis, possibly undetected, one or more of our organic sources. These are the technical issues. Wonderful set of bodies. But it's worthwhile to think up by thinking about a couple of other issues. First of all, we need to think about how to take all these, what I believe are really exciting ideas, and communicate them to our stakeholders. Why should we frequently hear when we're talking with our Office of Populations or whatever it's called in a given organization, statistical agency, is well, these numbers are fine, but you see, most people don't really have much interest in numbers. They're interested in stories. So if we, we have reduced our standard error by X percent, that may not really resonate with many of our stakeholders. On the other hand, a story attached to this about the value that we can deliver can very much resonate. How do we find ways to communicate all the complexity I've been referring to the last hour? How do we communicate in that way with our key stakeholders who need to understand this and appreciate the efforts and the complexities that we have involved with it? How do we find it with their needs and priorities? And how to tie it back in with the fundamentals involving quality, risk, and cost? How do we communicate about things like the length and cost and risk related to development cycles? We do often have development cycles that don't work out for any number of reasons despite our very best effort. How do we communicate that in a way that doesn't scare people off, but at the same time gives them a relatively sober understanding of what limitations are? And more broadly, what can we say about expectations and decisions and communication that are the interface between the research world and the operational world? I think Don Dillman spends a lot of time in his 1996 article on it. And then a final point that's very much worth bearing in mind for this communication issue is any Time you have a new development, you'll we'll see a certain court hype cycle show up. And in fact, in the discussion of big data, there was an organization called Gartman, who in fact tracked what they referred to as a hype cycle. And a fundamental, natural way that human beings will react to pretty much anything new. There's nothing wrong with that, that's just the way people are. But how do we, as statistical operators within that area, understand that? And how do we understand the underlying norm and style of negotiation? Again, we don't want to undersell what we're doing, but at the same time, we want to be sure that our stakeholders have a sober understanding of both strengths and limitations of what we're doing. Um, and anyway, uh, so finally, in the area of communication, we need to think about ways in which disruptive innovations in particular can cause fundamental changes in the expectation that we have both for our internal and external stakeholders, and may also be a very good time for us to reaffirm the core principles of what we're doing. Go back to what I said about the mission statement at the start. The mission is to produce high quality information on a sustainable and cost effective basis. At that very level, the world hasn't changed. The awful lot of details relate to this have changed. Final point in terms of changing the style of economic conditions. I've been talking about these factors. Z. It's worthwhile to bear in mind that as underlying societal and economic conditions change, that means e-values are going to change, and the corresponding coefficients I was referring to as betas, send a way in which we characterize and understand our surface. Those are also going to be changing over time. And when we see changes in underlying societal patterns, I've already talked about some examples. For example, telephone surveys. We talked about the good news back in the 1960s and 70s. On the other hand, how many people here are involved with telephone surveys as of 10 years ago? Okay. And we lose a lot of more recently saying, eh, response rates going down dramatically and other problems like that. Fundamental changes underlying societal attitudes, we can characterize the changes in our values as data. Bottom line is that the cost quality trade offs that we have with phone surveys from 10 or 20 or 30 years ago do not necessarily apply today. 
the slice to an awful lot of our prospective uses or current uses of non survey data sources as well. In addition, we may have changes in the linkage that we have between stakeholder value and quality risk and cost. Uh, and then finally, we have to think about the public goods issues that I've been highlighting a few minutes ago. So, for eight, um, I've been discussing the uh, idea of po positive sum innovation for integration of multiple data sources. Thinking about that in the context of in which we're seeing a very rapid set of changes in our operating space. Changes in stable needs, methodology and technology, changes in available, available sources. And our suggestion is that if we're going to make productive use of that as a broad statistical community involving both government agencies and also partners in the academic and private sector, to think about this in terms of positive sum decisions. We need to get past organizational and uncertainty features that may in some, in some sense drag us into zero sum or negative sum exercises. Let's say, how do we structure this as a positive sum exercise? We've tried to address that by saying, let's think about a thought experiment, a design that we might have to enhance value, and try to tie that in with available information and limitations on that information about our decisions of quality, risk, and cost, and linkage particular design factors that we may be able to control, as well as our underlying, um, as well as underlying um, environmental factors. Finally, we've been emphasizing that it's crucial, even if we talk about hypothetical models, we're talking about methodology and technology. It's very much worthwhile to bear in mind we're always talking with human beings throughout the entire course of this. We get in mind the human element of this in terms of things like management structure and incentives, as well as communication with a very wide range of stakeholders. So, thank you. Um, yeah, but should we take some questions or what's your preference? Okay. And for the benefit of people uh, who are on the phone, is Wendy here or somebody else who knows the mechanics? Do we need to have our standardized questions? Should they come up here? Yes. Okay. Okay. Well, I guess we can pass the microphone. First. Uh, yeah, that's a really good point. Um, and it's interesting to think about the evolution of an awful lot of our work. It is frequently the case that you will start out with one really strong reason that we have to produce estimates on X. And then over the course of time, you see two developments that are closely linked with what Nat was saying. One is that we'll have a whole lot of other folks, other stakeholders, finding use for that. Second, you say, you know, as long as we're collecting that, maybe we can also produce estimates of something else. Classic example of this is uh, the Consumer Price Index. Bill Iotrowski is here and he gives a lecture on the history of the BLS a number of times per year. Um, so he may want to correct me or add further comments. But I understand correctly, the entire reason the Consumer Price Index began was that during World War I, ship builders 
in the United States. They were contracting with the U.S. Navy. They were going to the U.S. Navy and saying, uh, we need to increase our prices. Why? Because our workers, in fact, have their cost of living skyrocketing in certain areas that were building the ships, understandable for housing and other reasons. Um, and for some reason, the government actually wanted evidence uh, to support that assertion. Uh, and so, in fact, we developed a first round of consumer price index work in there. But we have many sub industries and a whole lot of other work done into that, including uh, estimates separately for certain demographic groups. And I'm going to add anything to that. That's an example. Um, you say, wait a minute, well, as long as we're doing this work, we need to expand that to serve other stakeholders. Needs. And today, if we said, uh, if, if Bill were to submit a budget uh, proposal uh, back to Congress, and if he were to put in the first paragraph, as his primary reason for reducing the consumer price index, shipbuilding uh, uh, wage rates, uh, he probably would not get a good reaction. On the other hand, pointing things like Social Security, uh, many of the facts uh, that are linked with the consumer price index, it's already obvious to any reasonable person uh, that that has to be considered. Uh, so we have shifting over time. That's one of the crucial things about looking at the user groups as well as, as, as the different values. Same is true in many cases for public health. Are we are just trying to get an overall snapshot? Or are we, if we're a pharmaceutical firm, trying to understand what the market looks like, how many people have this health condition, for example, um, as well as people trying to understand, wait a minute, what kind of linkage do I have between that health condition and, for example, underlying demographic, environmental, uh, perhaps behavioral factors. As a hypothetical exercise here, again, these are schematic models, so we need to be a little careful about, about interpretation of it. Um, it's a really good question. Um, and for the moment, as our uh, schematic hypothetical exercise here, uh, you might think, for example, consider just one estimator uh, for the time being. Uh, you might think about, for example, mean squared error of it. Um, but then you might want to think about other characteristics of it as well. Uh, for example, to have some measure of risk attached to that related to prospective loss of one or more of your sources. Um, and so at that point you say, well, maybe that second dimension is something that looks like a hazard function. Um, and if so, what other predictor variables do you want to incorporate in that hazard function? Um, mentions involving cost. Uh, Bob Groves has a book from 1989 on survey errors and survey costs. And then also um, Alan, uh, Alan Card, my, um, my last uh, really nice 2006 paper in which they also uh, carried out a review of a lot of issues related to cost for survey data collection. As I touched on here, if we're thinking about integration of multiple sources, we need to go beyond that and think about considerably more complex uh, cost functions. Um, but cost itself is going to involve several dimensions, like burden, for example, as the outright cash expenditure by our agencies. Uh, so in principle, you'd like to think about it in a very rigorous quantitative way. However, uh, Paul Beamer and several colleagues have a wonderful paper in Journal Official Statistics from 2014, in which they talked about quality evaluations at statistics in Sweden. And it's fascinating to see the discussion because they acknowledge the full total survey error model and everything like that. But for many of the quality characteristics that they discuss in that paper, it's available uh, at their free uh, JOS.nu. Um, if you look at that paper, and point for an awful lot of the quality characteristics that they were most focused on. And they were asking very basic questions like, do the personnel in this particular area have training in, and then fill in the blank, in some particular area? Or will have, do you have detailed documentation of your procedures for fill in the blank? The way they ended up characterizing that is so-called Harvey balls. Most of you are familiar with Harvey Balls from Consumer Reports magazine, in which you look and you say, gee, I'm thinking about buying a car. 
and you look in there, you see the so-called Harvey balls. They're either an entire white circle or an entire uh, dark circle, something uh, partially in between those two. And that calibrates on essentially how good a particular quality characteristic is, like uh, are the seats comfortable, is the car noisy, what's its gas mileage, and things like that. Gas mileage is a good example. You can write down the number under certain conditions. You can also characterize that in relatively simple summary form like this Harvey ball. Paul and his co authors on that, in going down that second path, especially for certain types of qualitative things, like do you know have good documentation available, or do you have a good training of personnel in this particular area? And Dan Casper has been involved with some of that follow up work. I don't know if Dan's to comment at all on that. Type of work. Yeah. Get a mic in front of that. Um, Dan, you're muted. Can you hear me? Follow up on Dan's comments there. I really like that summary. Um, uh, Paul and his colleagues um, uh, looked primarily at Bean Square, and they were effectively conditioning on all of the other characteristics like timeliness and relevance and things like that. Um, and that's often a strategy you end up seeing if you're trying to carry out something that amounts to optimizations, you end up having to say, I've got to optimize, I have to condition on something to get any kind of traction at all. Um, in some ways, it's a formal mathematical exercise of saying, I've got to reduce my dimensionality, get any traction. But also, in relational terms, means perhaps you have a consensus among your stakeholders. This is an acceptable level of timeliness, relevance, things like that. Uh, do the best you can in these other dimensions. You can have an interesting debate about what should you be conditioning on, rather than what should you essentially have in play as characteristics that you're trying trying to do. Dan, about um, you have to have management engaged is really crucial. It ties in with the idea that we've got to have incentives. Um, and closely related notion is something. Um, how many people trained had your first class in computer programming somewhere in the 1970s, before age, or earlier? What was one of the first things you probably got a lecture from your instructor about? You've got to document your code. You've got to document your code. Uh, and then if you look at any number of organizations, you get a sheepish discussion of, well, we know we're supposed to. We do it some. But do it as well as possible. And my understanding, and we have a number of computers in the audience who may want to talk further about this, my understanding is that one way in which that has been addressed in the computer science world is to simply say, quote, modern software engineering has the following expectations. This is what we mean by documentation, as opposed to a just exhortation, golly, got to be a document. Specific ex expectations that are in some ways relatively enforceable, and you can say this constitutes really customary practice, in this case, in computer science. To what extent can we translate those concepts to say this is what constitutes really customary practice and methodology? Some is, are in some ways very well established, very stable. In some ways, that, again, you're living that nice, well-defined goal that I was describing before may be feasible. 
On the other hand, if you're trying to do some very aggressive work, again, carry out some depth of innovations, that may not be a realistic expectation. Okay, thank you for coming. Uh, very much appreciated.